I can count on one hand the amount of times my life has been broken down into seconds, where I consciously remember counting to escape the reality I was experiencing. But at some point, those seconds became minutes, became hours, became days, stuck in this perpetual state of counting as a distraction. But for what? When I was 18 years old, I saved up enough money to go on my first study abroad trip, Madrid. I had been studying Spanish in school for years, learning about their language and culture. I had prepared myself for everything I thought that summer could throw at me. I even remember having a four block radius street map printed out in a folder waiting to be used. It never was. And then, a week after I arrived, just a few days before my 19th birthday, I was rudely awakened to my own naivete, lost without a map to find my way back to it. 16 minutes, that is how long it lasted, how long he held me there before I was able to leave. 16 minutes that would end up defining the next two years of my life. I'm sometimes asked what I thought about during that time. I remember thinking about the word no. I remember pausing to wonder if it, I was mispronouncing it, if even in my broken Spanish, I had forgotten how the word felt in my mouth. I remember the word rape survivor, feeling homeless in my mind, thought they could never fit in my hands. I did not know how to hold the weight of that noun. I knew rape the way most of you know it, a story a narrative that excludes men from the title survivor. What was happening to me while contradictory, didn't feel real. Five hours, how long I waited in one hospital before being told, we can't treat you here, try somewhere else. With the crime scene sitting in a plastic bag against my feet, the employees staring and whispering in Spanish, I waited for five hours to be referred to a different hospital. There, Four hands examined me, two police officers asked for my statement, three different medications prescribed, come back in six weeks. Twelve metro stops, two connections, class at three. That day, my life broke into a segmented chunk of numbers. Only two counselors available, one speaks English, 45 minutes away. It was easily digestible. Counting. When I met with them, they told me, I've never met with a male survivor before and I retreated into the self-proclaimed feeling of being first. When I returned to the United States, I was met with the same foreign idea, the global prescription that men could not, would not be survivors. Three words followed me through my search for support, for women only. A disheartening sentence I got accustomed to repeating in my head, for women only. Support groups, counseling sessions, resources, I had found my way into an area I was not welcome, forced to navigate it alone. It's been over two years since I was sexually assaulted. For most of those two years, I counted number of days since it happened. I was living on a man-made timeline, living a life that started on that street in Madrid. My perception of life revolved around how far I could get away from that street. Counting reassured me every day that I was distancing myself. But the healing did not start until I stopped counting, until I reflected back on those two years and I started to forgive. After Spain, I became reclusive, a shell of a former self I did not recognize anymore. I struggled with basic tasks, eating, sleeping, showering, my grades fell, I distanced myself from my friend groups, stopped going to class. Trauma, I learned, does not rest when you need it to. And I could only distract myself for so long before it inevitably woke up. And it did. And when it did, I was forced to face the fact that my whole life, the, what I had planned for myself, who I had pictured becoming, had been distorted, as your reflection does, in disturbed water. The roadmap I had clung to shredded now. I had to look at myself in the mirror and get to know the stranger that was now inhabiting my body, carrying me through the banality of every day. Blame took over my thoughts, blaming myself for going to Spain, 
for taking that metro line, for the weakness of having to admit to myself every day that I would never be the same, and that I was alone in that blame, a blame no one could take on or carry for me. Forgiveness found its way into my life when a friend finally pointed at my perceived weakness and renamed its strength. The idea suddenly took on a new meaning, one that celebrated my strength for getting out of bed rather than shaming me for not doing it earlier, for eating something, quieting the voice in my head that said it wasn't enough. I had to realize that I was holding myself to a standard that forgot my own trauma, one that expected the perfection I had once strived for. My forgiveness started and continued with the redefinition of what success looked like. I had to give myself a period of time where society's bare minimum was good enough. Good enough was the grace I extended to myself that required me to love all of me, but to also see that good enough as a coping mechanism adopted to keep me alive rather than as a true reflection of who I was, who I am. Two police officers asked me why I didn't want to report. You're letting a rapist walk the streets freely. One friend asked to see a picture after I disclosed what I had experienced. I wanted to see if he was attractive, they said. Articles, TV shows, society kept accusing me of the same thing. It doesn't happen to guys. Men wouldn't let that happen to them. You could have fought back. Those words repeated in my head long after, so much so that they became internalized voices that I had adopted as my own. And with that, so too came the resentment. Resentment not only in the extreme responses, ones of police officers and friends victim blaming, but of the more subtle responses. A lack of empathy from a family member brought with it the same pain. It was resentment that would craft elaborate stories of why someone would never check up on me, why a friend would ask for a picture or a police officer for a statement. They were written into my mind as characters meant to reiterate my very fear that no one knew how to support, much less talk to, a male sexual assault survivor, that I was alone. But I had forgotten to humanize them. I had isolated myself from the idea that humans act human. I expected the perfect response, the exact words that would put my pain into perspective a fix. It was those exact expectations that prevented me from healing. My resentment at this humanness put up a barrier to forgiving these people. Most importantly, however, I decided that their mistakes were from miseducation rather than spite. So I educated. I went on to conduct research abroad as well as here at Virginia Tech about sexual violence and how it impacts academic success and financial stability. And I'm currently in the process of starting the first collegiate male survivor support group on the East Coast. This all to say that advocacy was my way of showing friends and strangers alike what I needed, and to remind male survivors like myself that they are not alone. To understand that no one can read my mind, but anyone can educate themselves and help. And finally, my rapist. Inevitably, I found myself blindly trusting forgiveness. It suited me until it didn't, until I had to face the idea that I had forgiven everyone in my life except the one who shadowed it, the one who I found tethered to my person. I had to let him go. And it wasn't until recently that I learned the most important lesson of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a loud declaration of apologetic empathy wrapped in cliches and guilt. Forgiveness, rather, is a quiet, humble acknowledgement of pain, one that needs no response, a monologue that needs no rebuttal, no closure from both parties. Forgiveness is selfish because it requires you to release the anger and the pain and the sadness and the good enough for yourself and no one else. 
You release all of these with the hope and the confidence that better is waiting in the after, that you are more than the situation you feel reduced down to. I have never forgiven the rape. It was cruel, and it took more of me away from myself than I care to remember. But selfishly, I have forgiven him. I have forgiven the idea of him lingering in my head. I know there will always be a part of me that will remember his face, what his room smelled like, the street address, or the background noise of news. But there is a peace that I've come to, a peace that knows it will never change no matter how many times I rewind that tape. It has been over two years since I was sexually assaulted, and the number of days continues to go up. But that mental clock, that man-made timeline I constructed, has changed. I no longer see myself as a before and after of my sexual assault, but rather before and after finding the strength to forgive. A shedding of my shadow and my guilt and my shame, like winter clothing finally stepping out into spring. And to Sergio, my shadow, I forgive you. Thank you.